of. Okay, and our first speaker, our first speaker is uh, Thomas Van Riet, uh, who is going to talk about uh, the sitter and string theory. So Thomas, the, the floor is yours. Okay, David, uh, thank you very much. And, and thank you very much for um, giving me the opportunity to try to review the situation of, of string theory and the sitter space. Although it's, uh, it's not an easy task, to be honest, especially for uh, given that this is a broad audience. Um, so I think it's actually impossible to do this. Okay, less than two hours. And I have been given uh, 30 minutes uh, for this task. Um, so I'll try to essentially just convey a simple point and be happy with that. And I should also mention while doing, while trying to convey a simple point, I'm, I'm sure, unfortunately, it will be slightly biased uh, because I've been working on this topic a lot before. And I probably also mentioned too much my own work, okay? Um, so let us just start right away. And I think for this conference, you should ask yourself the question, if for instance, I work on data, why should I even care about this discussion of the sitter space um, and string theory? But let me remind you that the problem of dark energy theoretically is really a problem of high energy physics, not of low energy physics. In fact, it's a problem of the highest energy scales. So it's a quantum gravity problem. And why that is the case is really because of the CC hierarchy problem. Despite dark energy, you know, setting the Hubble scale at the moment, so we're talking about the largest length scales in nature. Um, if you think about quantum field theory in the usual way, what determines that length scale is in fact, uh, that large length scale is in fact the highest energy scales, right? Because in the most naive way of computing vacuum energy, there's a sum of loop diagrams and you tend to cut them off at the scale of new physics, okay? So the most naive guess is that the cosmic constant is sort of, of the order of the, the, new, the scale of new physics beyond the standard model. Of course, that's a very naive interpretation of the problem. The more modern and effective field theory way of viewing, viewing it is more like in this picture, okay? It's more a fine tuning problem in the following sense that any slides, so here is a, a in this graph, the horizontal line is representing energy scales, where here I have the ultraviolet and here I have the infrared and it's in the infrared that I'm actually computing, that I'm measuring, I'm, I'm making cosmological observations, okay? So for any, you know, what we would say relevant operator like vacuum energy or the Higgs mass, any tiny change in the ultraviolet physics, which would not influence the standard model, would completely change the value of the thing we are measuring in the infrared. And so you see here, any tiny change, you can shoot off to very high Planckian values for the cosmic constant or very negative ones, et cetera. Okay, that's in essence, the cosmic constant problem. Okay, so it's really hard from effective field theory or standard quantum field theory. So that's why it could be nice to work with a theory which pretends to be UV complete like string theory. If it pretends to be UV complete, it means that string theory should know how to compute vacuum energy. They don't need to introduce cutoffs in their calculations. And how do they do that? Well, they do that by using a completely different language, namely the language of physics at the highest energy scales, which is different language. It's a language about extra dimensions. It's a language about brains, things we call fluxes, etc. Okay. And so before I try to give you the rough picture of how that works and what people think, I can already try to tell you roughly why this discussion is still going on for more than 20 years and why we're still arguing. So why is it naively hard to get the sitter? And I'm talking about the most naive arguments, okay? Obviously, so one thing string theorists have a hard time with is breaking supersymmetry. The sitter space necessarily breaks supersymmetry. A supersymmetry wants either zero or negative vacuum energy. So positive vacuum energy breaks it, okay? And the moment we have to break supersymmetry, we kind of tend to lose control over our computations. Another argument is more statistical. You know, typically in a string theory scenario, you end up with an effective field theory at low energies, which contains many scalar fields. The vacuum value of uh, vacuum energy 
is answered by you know, finding a minimum in the scalar potential of many fields. But in, in general, there are really a huge amount of fields. Okay, and you have to be really lucky in such a, in a global landscape that you actually find a global minimum. The more fields you have, the more chances you have of getting actually a tachyonic direction in a critical point. And that is why maybe very roughly speaking, anti de Sitter space, so a negative cosmological constant is much easier in string theory because anti de Sitter space can actually have a tachyon as long as it's not too negative in mass and still be metastable or fully stable. The Sitter space cannot, okay? But I don't think any of these statements, which are often quoted, at all explain the real difficulties we are having at the moment, okay? As so many people, including me, wonder, is there something deeper going on? There are even conspiracy thinkers who suspect that string theory contains no sitter vacua whatsoever. And such people used to be a minority, and I would say an extreme minority. But thanks to the search of the Swamp Land program, this line of thought at least has become sort of acceptable. Okay, but then also let me remind you that this is not really a debate only within string theory. If you check just the literature on, on quantum field theory, quantum gravity, then debating the very existence of the Sitter space as a consistent background is much older. And you know there were very influential works, Polyakov, Valley, many other people who have been saying, no, we don't think the Sitter space can actually exist in the naive way we think about the Sitter space. What does that mean? It roughly means that the, the nice isometries of the Sitter space are broken at, you know, at a deeper level, at the quantum gravity level. And what does that mean observationally? Probably it means that the equation of state parameter of dark energy, if it's there at all, is not exactly minus one because that would entail the isometries of the Sitter space. Right, so how do we go about uh, and try to find these, you know, try to find a positive cosmological constant within string theory? As I said, the theory claims to be UV complete, so we don't need to um, introduce a cutoff. So how do we go and compute? Well, first of all, you probably heard that the, the vanilla model of, of string theory, supercritical string theory, contains 10 dimensions of space time. So you need to compactify six of them. That's already a very awkward starting point. Somehow you start with a space which has a metric on it for which you declare four dimensions to be essentially carrying a length scale, which is like the Hubble scale. And the six other ones for some dark reason, we don't know, have a length scale, which is so small that we haven't yet observed it in any accelerator. Okay, anyhow, this would be the starting point, which is clearly extremely unnatural. And this unnaturalness essentially is already giving you the CC naturalness problem, okay? It's very related to it. So just to get my terminology right, um, the scale of this metric we call Hubble scale, the scale of this metric, there's also a length scale, we call it the kaluza klein scale. And so that's the mass scale associated with fluctuations of fields inside these extra dimensions, All right? So then how do we compute? So we say, okay, this is sort of a metric ansatz. So let's see whether the string theory equations of motion can um, be consistent with such a metric ansatz, right? Um, so how do we set up these computations? Of course, you probably heard, especially when we break supersymmetry, string theory is not a theory where you can just do any calculation with. There are only tiny corners of a theory where we know how to do computations. And these corners, I like to call it the boundary of string moduli space. That sounds fancy, but I mean something rather simple. String theory comes with a coupling constant, like any other field theory that you know. And we call it the string coupling constant. And if it's very small, we can set up a perturbative expansion, just like in field theory. So that's one requirement. If we make it small, we can do, good, we can do lots of calculations. And a second thing we impose is that all field gradients of so space-time fields are small with respect to this string scale. Why is that? Because then in the effective field theory, you can control higher derivative expansions. So roughly speaking, the curvature should be small enough and volumes, internal volumes like of extra dimension should at least be large enough with respect to the string scale so that we can trust our approximations, okay? So it's essentially doing 10 dimensional supergravity with some leading quantum corrections if we do that. Now there's one big difference with field theory, which is at the core of the problem. In field theory, 
you can say I'm looking at QED with a certain value of the coupling and you set up your expansion. String theory is different. I told you there's a coupling, but that's not really true. As you know, the beauty of string theory is that it doesn't come with any undetermined number, okay? So in fact, the coupling itself and the sizes of extra dimensions and other things are all fields themselves and they need to be stabilized in the vacuum, okay? So it's sort of, you really need a self-consistency approach if you want to do this. You, you on the one hand need to compute this value and then you have to make sure it's small enough so that the approximation to compute it is correct, okay? And by the way, these two numbers are very important. <clears throat> once you know the strings, the string coupling, once you know the size of the extra dimensions, you have also fixed the Planck scale, the Planck mass. Um, in four dimensions, by the way, this should be a square, my apologies. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so this is what I tried to say, but now with a picture. So we are good at doing computations in this tiny corner of string moduli space. So this is the inverse coupling. If I go to infinity, it means I am at weak coupling. And I also want my internal, all my length scales or the volumes to be large enough, but still small enough that I don't observe them, okay? So once you're in this corner here, you can really do 10 dimensional supergravity with some leading quantum corrections. And that's the most used framework to do all of this, okay? Um, I think I don't want this talk to be entirely just, you know, without equations. So I at least want to give you a flavor because I think this can be understood by people that are not working on the theory easily um, to give you just a flavor of how we do these calculations. And I just give the highlight the simplest parts in it. Okay. So there are three elements and in fact, there are way more, but the three basic elements is that we have extra dimensions. These extra dimensions have magnetic fluxes in them. And they're also brains. And it's a combination of these three that tend to be playing crucial role in all of our comp computations, okay? And there's some very simple physics associated to all three of these ingredients. So if you naively dimensionally use a 10 dimensional Einstein Hilbert action, you see that, okay, you get four dimensional Einstein Hilbert action and you get something extra. This something extra is actually an energy, okay? Because it appears just like that in the, in the, in the action in four dimensions. Right, and what is, if you just look at this, you can already see some very simple physics. If the extra dimensions have a positive curvature, think of them like a sphere, then this action is telling you by just looking at the sign in front of it, that this sphere actually dynamically wants to collapse to a point because then you lower the energy. But imagine instead of a, a sphere, the extra dimensions would be say in the shape of a compact hyperboloid, you have the opposite effect. It would actually like to expand Okay, keep that in mind. Now I can do a second thing with these extra dimensions. I can put in these magnetic fields, which are abundant in string theory. What are these magnetic fields? They're not your typical magnetic field of Maxwell theory, but they're very similar. Okay, so string theory comes with, if you like, it's like Maxwell, it comes with forms, which is more than a vector. It's a form, it's something with more indices. These are P forms and string theory has many of those. So what do we do with these P forms? we actually um, give them non-zero vacuum expectation values inside these extra dimensions. And that also very entails very simple physics. So think of some extra, you know, extra, a few extra dimensions, you put a magnetic field inside of them, and then you try to squeeze those extra dimensions. And of course, intuitively what should happen is that you cannot squeeze field lines. It costs you energy, okay? So that's also why we like to use these fluxes. So on the one hand, you can have, for instance, an effect that a dimension is positively curved, it wants to collapse, but then you can put in some magnetic fields and then it wants to expand and maybe there's an equilibrium. It finds like a balance of forces. There's one more typical ingredient of the three that I'm going to mention, there are way more, that's brains. Okay, so you probably heard string theory, theory of brains as well, which are endpoints of strings. And what I can do with these brains, I can make them feel our whole four dimensional space time. Then we would be living on top of them essentially. And then you can make them wrap some internal dimensions. Okay, here is a picture of that. Now the physics of a brain is also, at least the essence of it is relatively simple. You can think of it like rubber band physics. Okay, if I, if I wrap a brain around a certain dimension, of course, under its weight, it wants to collapse these extra dimensions. Okay, that's yet another way to associate force with the size of an extra dimension. 
But then the weird thing of string theory, and I'm not going to explain this, is that brains come in two kinds. There are brains with positive tension, which is normal. And then there are also objects, which is very awkward, which have negative tension. It would be like a negative mass particle, something that normally cannot exist. In fact, in string theory, it can consistently exist. And so what is the game that we're playing, roughly speaking, but this is extremely heuristic, but I think you can get a picture here. We're trying to balance all of these forces and try to find a vacuum. So if you would write the energy, there's energy in fluxes, there's energy in brains, and there's energy in curvature. And you try to balance these effects against each other. If you then compute the potential, what you're hoping is that you're not in some anti sitter minimum. You're really hoping that you find some metastable the sitter minimum here, okay? Now, what is crucial is that when we play those games, we arrange the solution in the region of moduli space, in the region of scalar field space, such that I can end up trusting the approximation, okay? And this is why it's a difficult game. This can easily go wrong, and it's pretty dirty to, to all of this together, okay? You can just see it. I gave you a laundry list of only three elements, and it's already looking complicated, okay? This is why, roughly speaking, it's a complicated game. Play. But the upshot, and this is why people were very enthusiastic in, in the beginning of 2000, is that these fluxes, what they allowed to do us is to solve an old problem in quantum field theory, which was known as the Dine Cyborg problem. So, very roughly speaking, what did Dine and Cyborg try to tell us? They said, look, if you're in quantum field theory, you just look at a typical potential for a scalar field, what happens at, at small coupling, it's typically going to be runaway. But at small coupling, which is this part here, you don't have the quantum effects anymore. They're not important that can stabilize the, this potential, you know, that can introduce some bumps, so to speak. And those bumps, they, they exist when quantum, quantum effects are strong, but that's at strong coupling. So they said, look, typically our universe, we expect it to be highly strongly coupled. Okay, that's, and strongly coupled means non-calculable, right? And this is, by the way, why I had the picture of Russell's teapot on my first slide. Yeah? It's this issue of non-calculable that is coming to play. But the aim of the flux compactification program was to say, hey, we actually have classical ingredients that we can add to this potential, which can maybe stabilize us at a weak part, at a part of field space where the couplings are weak and we can trust our calculation. Okay, So that was the, the hope. But I think what I mean, you're asking me to explain what is this of the sitter space in string theory. My main summary, if this is the only thing you can get from this talk, that would be very good actually, is that you should know that I believe we're now almost reaching a consensus in our field that this hope is in vain. It's not working out, okay? So whenever we use these fluxes to look in this part of the moduli space where we can trust calculations, we seem to find only anti the sitter vacuum. Is that hard to understand? Maybe, but let me still give it a try. It's a basic thing if you know a bit about string theory or supergravity, but if you don't, so maybe you can follow this example. So one of the most famous solutions in string theory is in fact an anti de Sitter vacuum. It's not four-dimensional, it's five-dimensional. It's of the form ADS5, so five-dimensional de Sitter space times a five sphere, okay? What you can do, you can put a magnetic field in that S5 and you can crank it up all the way to infinity. And as you do that, all the length scales go to infinity and you're, you know, you're going to this point of moduli space here. In this particular solution, the coupling is a free parameter and you can just go here. And then indeed the solution hides here and you trust your approximation, okay? Now, such a cranking up of a certain number to push yourself here does not work for the sitter. It just doesn't, it's just not never been possible. Okay. In fact, this is only been sort of argued in a more precise way in the last couple of years. Okay. So the idea is that you know, give up this hope. There will never be a number to crank up so that we end up here. And this is consistent with a more heuristic approach, which is you might have heard the word, which is which are. Are, it's called a swampland program, and I will explain this in a bit more detail. Okay, but this is the essence that I want to convey this slide, I think. Okay, but you should appreciate how non obvious this is, and I think many people do not, because string theory comes with a lot of dualities. Okay, 
So I could say, well, there's a string theory, maybe let's take type 2A, and I can only compute in the weakly coupled regime. That is, in fact, not true. You can also go to strong coupling, and then you end up here by some duality. And, you know, you can hop around. So the fact that we have different string theories which are dual to each other means that we can also, I mean, in the fact that each time we exclude the Sitter vacuum in the parametric, parametric weak regimes for every separate string theory, means that we're also excluding Sitter vacua in opposite parts of moduli space, namely at very high coupling, okay? So it's kind of non-obvious to come to the statement that there's no the Sitter at weak coupling. So I would say that, and I want to now really highlight for a while this, the Swampland program and explain it a bit. I would say that my honest opinion, what we have learned in the last say three, four years is exactly what I just explained to you now. It's kind of accepting that the dyne cyber problem is never really evaded in string theory using what we call fluxes. So what have we seen the last couple of years? Because something really changed, say around 2017, 2018. And we have seen four approaches. So one approach, which I will not mention for the rest of the talk, is that some people just carry on as in the old days and they just try to work harder and find more examples and try to get better approximations. Some other people say, look, it's, it's time to do something different. We have to go beyond the typical technical battles. And we probably should try to follow like a heuristic approach mixed with highly technical work. We should try to find patterns of why things don't work and what does work. And we should try to find links with other branches of physics. And this is a swamp plan program. Other people try to find more decider constructions, but involving less use ingredients. They try to move away from the typical lamppost. Finally, and this is what I've been mostly involved in, is some try to scrutinize the existing decider constructions through detailed technical computations and see whether you can really show that it falls apart or actually it still works. And I would say this line of research is also motivated by the Swamp Plan program. The rest of my talk, I will divide, devote to two and three because of lack of time. Okay, so let me start with trying to explain you the swamp plant program a little bit better. So what is the definition of the swamp plant? It's kind of not so difficult. It's the following idea. And here in the picture, you see string theory, but it can be generalized to quantum gravity. So what we're assuming is that at the highest energy scale, there is a theory or maybe a set of theories if you wanna go beyond string theory, which is fine. And this is a theory of the highest energy scales. And of course, you need to flow to the infrared, and then a lot can happen. Okay. In an infrared, you can have a huge manifold of effective field theories. And that's what you see here. This is effective field theory space, right? The point of the swamp plant is that some effective field theories can be fine within quantum field theory, meaning you know they're unitary or whatever you want to demand of, of, of a theory. But in fact, if it's in the swamp land, it means that it can never come from a UV complete theory. So that makes it essentially useless, okay? Yeah. So what you want to focus on is what we call the landscape. These are th effective field theories, which we know can be embedded in the UV complete uh, theory, right? So this you could say, well, people have been doing this all, all along, right? So what is new about the Swamp Land program? Well, I think it's mainly a paradigm shift. It's sort of a reformulation of what are the important questions in string cosmology or string phenomenology. So instead of the, you know, now I'm a bit negative, but let me nonetheless continue. So instead of trying to reverse effective field, re reverse engineer effective field theories, and you arrive at some hand waving, you know, almost anything goes picture, because that's the picture of the landscape and the multiverse, people change their mind and they say, okay, let's, let's go back. We're gonna ask ourselves instead of the question, what is allowed, we're gonna ask ourselves the question, what is not allowed? Logically, it's identical, but the approach psychologically or sociologically, whatever, is completely different, okay? Loosely speaking, we go from equalities, trying to write down explicit Lagrangians, to inequalities. Inequalities trying to define what are the boundaries in, in effective field theory space between the swamp land and the landscape. Okay. Important keywords, I think, to keep in mind with this program, why it differs from conservative 
string phenomenology or cosmology is that it's much more interdisciplinary. Okay. You will see, you know, people discussing cosmology are at the same time discussing black hole physics, quantum information theory, holography. Okay. And also, there's much more focus on the why, on trying to find patterns within affective field theories that we know are consistently coming from string theory. Maybe some of you that have heard of this program have heard quite some criticism because there's a lot of heuristics there. I think that is not entirely correct. So the program has a very heuristic part, but is backed up by a huge amount of highly mathematical and technical work. Let, let us keep that in mind. However, I do agree on the following statement, which I think all swamp people working on the swamp land agree with. It's the following picture, okay? So this is a two-sided arrow. Here, you see trustworthy swamp land statements, things that went from a conjecture to essentially a theorem. On the other side, unfortunately, when the trustworthiness of swamp land statements or conjectures becomes way less, that's exactly when they become useful to, you know, cosmologists, people working with actual data. And that is a problem, no, of course, not unexpected. And of course, we hope that as time goes forward, we can solve this problem. Five, so, five but, minutes left. Yeah, I think I can almost get there. So let me quickly tell you something about the heuristic part, especially of interest to cosmologists, okay? So in 2018, what happened is that on the Shrinks conference, uh, Bafa made the claim that you know the sitter space can never be obtained from string theory, even through an inequality at, at, at towards it. Okay, so if here's an effective potential, the derivative should always be bigger than some positive value c divided by Planck times v. So if v is positive, you cannot get this excludes the existence of a sitter vacuum. It excludes all the sitter vacuum. However, you can immediately see that the Higgs potential, if you think about it and you go to the minimum, to the middle, is probably a counterexample. In fact, another counterexample known at the time was actually the work I had been involved in. We already wrote down, you know, actual classical de Sitter solutions from string theory. However, they all had tachyons, okay? So we never found them in, in that sense that interesting, but at least they seem to go around this inequality. However, in hindsight, this equality could still have been correct because whenever we derived our um, effective potentials and when they were evading this, they were in fact not in the regime that you can trust them, but nonetheless. Um, because of this problem, it got refined, okay? People said, but wait a minute, maybe the sitter vacua are still allowed, but you know, if they're, they can, they just have to be sufficiently tachyonic, making them anyhow useless for, for dark energy. And this was the second inequality that appeared. Um, so this just means that whenever V is positive and there's an OR here, you have to have tachyons, which are big enough, okay? And then heuristic derivations of these inequalities appeared in a few papers. But what is interesting, all of these inequalities, all of these proofs have assumed explicitly that you're at a boundary of moduli space, okay? And away from that boundary, um, there is not a real conjecture anymore against the sitter space. There is something called a trans um, conjecture. And it essentially says that sub Planckian quantum fluctuations in string theory should not become super Hubble. Essentially, this would exclude the three universes that live very long. And for our own universe, it would mean that it should decay soon. But um, I don't want to discuss this too further because this is, uh, this is quite heuristic and it's not the point of my talk. Okay. I just want to give you two other. Swampland conjectures, one which is extremely, I say, essentially became a theorem, and this is the weak gravity conjecture. And this is a conjecture not for cosmology, but for the standard model, namely every charged particle, there, every theory should have a charged particle whose mass is lower than this value. Q is a charge and G is a coupling, this is Planck. This is obviously through for the, for the standard model, so you don't learn anything. And that's an example of what I gave here is a, a swamp land um, conjecture, which is probably completely true, but it's not so useful uh, to model builders because it's obviously true for the, for the standard model. However, in the sitter space, similar arguments tell you that there's one more condition. This we have called the Festina Lente proposal. 
And it tells you that every charged particle in your theory should be heavier than the following um, number, the coupling of some U1 field, say the QED coupling, the charge, and Planck and the Hubble constant. So this is getting interesting because there's some cosmology here, okay? Let me, for instance, tell you, if you look at a lot of papers on bottom-up the sitter constructions in supergravity, they violate this conjecture, okay? So these conjectures, well, there's a lot of pheno here, which I'm not going to describe, but they can be useful as sort of warning signs for model builders that something is going wrong, okay? And here is where we get them from. When I said that the Swampland program is very interdisciplinary, is because you get these things from looking at evaporation of black holes. If you look at a charged black hole in the sitter space, they all have to live within this region. So uh, usually in flat space, they all live here, in this region here. But in the sitter space, black holes can only have a maximum size, okay? They cannot go to the right of this picture. And just demanding that the evaporation of a black hole stays within this triangle tells you that these two inequalities have to be correct, okay? So this is just an example of something that is relevant for cosmology, for model building, which you actually get from something totally different, namely black hole physics. The final thing I want to do before um, my uh, conclusion is I want to show you what has been happened, what's been done the last couple of years, where people try to sort of be less negative and nonetheless try to construct the secret solutions, given all of this swamp land trouble. Okay, maybe I can only have the time for one example. Let's see, I've listed three small examples. Okay. So what did the group in Uppsala do? I think they had a great idea. They said, look, the problem really starts with the compactification answers. Let's give it up. Let's go to non-compact models and do the old school, well, do, again, go to things like Randall Sundrum. Let's think of brain world models, okay? And what they realized is something very nice. If you have an unstable anti de sitter solution, say a five-dimensional anti de sitter space, you know, Unstable ADS5 cross S5. It's going to decay through bubble nucleation. And what is in string theory such a bubble, the wall is always a brain. What you can compute from just the GR ex uh, exercise is that the cosmology on that brain world is exactly the C4. Okay, but the nice thing of string theory, we also know that gauge forces and matter are localized on that brain. So this is a completely new and kind of natural way to get a four-dimensional de Sitter universe from stringy ingredients such as unstable vacua, brains, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Another example, um, this is a paper by Cordova de Luca and Tomasiello, and they said, hey, actually we disagree. We found a classical de Sitter solution at weak coupling, okay? So let me quickly tell you what, what is going wrong here or not going wrong. The bottom line is the following. In their setup, which is something we also considered in previous papers, we couldn't find a Sitter solution. And nonetheless, they found it. And why did they find it? Because we, in our papers, had inequalities of this kind. What do you see here? This is the warp factor in front of four-dimensional space. And this is the curvature of four-dimensional space time. And we see this product has to be negative. Okay, and we concluded from that, ah, uh, okay, this excludes the sitter. This number cannot be positive. What happened in the setup of Thomas Yellow and friends, this number is not integrable. In fact, if you plot it numerically, there's a discrete jump. And this jump means there's some kind of a singularity and this singularity exactly happens at one of these, you know, brains in string theory. It's called an oriental thing, O8 minus. But what you need to know, why I'm telling you this very boring technical thing, so that you get a flavor of our discussion. So what is going on? Well, we also knew that these things are singular, but we never allowed this kind of singularity. And so now we're debating whether this kind of singularity is a good singularity in string theory or not. So you see that, I hope you understand when I say that the dyne cyber problem hits us again. To trust this statement, we have to suddenly understand string theory at the very tiniest length scales and try to understand the form of a singularity in a non-supersymmetric setup. And of course, that is very hard. So we are again sent, roughly speaking, to strong coupling to very difficult problems, okay? Let me not mention the last example I had in mind. So I hope I illustrated at least the new ideas that are on the table. And 
the kind of discussions that we are having to settle the status of the cedar space. So for my conclusion, I show a typical slide of frequently asked questions from, from people that are not working on string theory, but kind of want to know the situation. So they would ask, are there the cedar vacua and string theory? My answer would be, we are still arguing about it. And the answer is either none at all. And if there's one, there's almost certainly a landscape. Okay. Well, is there anything you people even agree upon, given there's so much debate? I would say yes. I think we're almost agreeing with each other that there are no solutions anymore in the weakly coupled controllable regimes. So has there been any progress at all in the last, say, 20 years? Personally, I would say for sure. If I think about how many discussions we had with colleagues and how many technical things we now agree on, I think we have learned an amazing new piece of physics, especially when it comes to supersymmetry breaking string theory. Okay, so I would say we agree on more things than before. But will we settle anytime soon on this discussion? This is where personally, I think it's a very tough problem. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas, for this very clear and ped pedagogical uh, talk. Thank you. So, do we have questions? If I see that, no, Norma is. Uh, Norma. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon or good morning. Um, uh, physically, if we can say it, uh, some physics uh, here. Um, the fact that why there is an obstruction in a string theory uh, to find the sitter uh, solutions, while it is not the case of anti the sitter backgrounds, is uh, um, already seen at the level of effective field theories of uh, strings, whatever the theories and all the fields, uh, all the, the, the tower of fields you could uh, include there, and whatever the dimensions, um, and uh, whatever we brains or, or the strings, is the fact that for, uh, when you really go to find, uh, I mean, the, these kind of solutions, you find that the dilaton, for instance, some, in some cases, other fields, uh, ha, uh, must have a complex part, which makes that the um, gravitational constant, she um, uh, gets negative. In, uh, in other words, you, you go to anti-gravity. While for anti the sitter, the same, I mean, the same type of answer, of course, because these are curvature, constant curvature backgrounds and, and so and all that. Uh, you, you get uh, real, uh, real fields and uh, gravity. And I should uh, complete uh, complement about the signature of the space time. Of course, if you are talking about cosmology, I mean, in the real, uh, in, in the cosmology we are, or inflation, you need also the right uh, um, signature of the metric. So it's really a, a, an abstraction. Uh, which is not the only uh, of, uh, shortcom shortcoming of a string theory um, hub. I mean, there are others, and in particular for, for particle physics. So I think uh, that um, I think that this Swampland pro proposal neither neither uh, neither goes in progress of that. I mean. Uh, of course, uh, uh, looks the problem from other types. Uh, you have you have the landscape, uh, and also you have, have landscape in, in already in string theory. But um, uh, some some plants have the problem. Uh, if I could say problem, I mean perhaps others see as a uh, as a, um, um, as a good uh, as a positive that you need a lot of uh, uh, not only pro Proposal, but uh, the series is uh, is going in terms of adding postulates or principles or adding no, but, but, yeah. that's that's I, I finish that. So yeah, please, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, I just want to comment very quickly on this uh, about two two aspects. Um, 
So it's not, I hope I didn't tell you that string theory for sure doesn't have the sitter vacua. I tried to tell you that if it has it, it is most likely hiding in a regime where we have not so much control over the calculations. Uh, of course, it's much more exciting if it would not have any of them, okay? That is actually a um, falsifiable statement. Um, then about the second thing of the swamp land, I really hope also, I try to tell you that it's not a set of postulates, it's much more so. These are conjectures which we are scrutinizing ourselves. And the, the, the good thing is that these conjectures are more trying to find patterns in effective field theory, something people haven't been trying sufficiently. And what I really find astonishing is that a lot of, well, a good amount of them, of the conjecture is almost getting lifted to theorems and others are maybe wrong. But this is only, uh, and I would say an approach in fundamental physics that is bound to go forward. I don't see how this program will ever fail in a way. If we conclude that string theory is not a good theory of nature, so, so be it. But we will learn a lot about at least the program. And also keep in mind the program is open to any quantum gravity theory, okay? So anybody with an alternative for string theory is welcome to try to address some of the inequalities or some of the thought experiments we're coming up with. Yeah. Elias for the next question. Um, uh, it is, I think, fair to remember that uh, uh, what we know so far about cosmology does not require the existence of a stable de Sitter vacuum in whatever your gravitational theory is. All we know is that there are periods that are nearly the sitter, and that's all we require. In fact, the old arguments uh, are based on physical principles that say that the sitter must be somehow unstable, and they're based, based on ideas of particle uh, production. And these things started people, you know, trying to make them more quantitative uh, more recently. So, uh, the only reason maybe we would like to have the sitter space is because theorists, you know, would like to start from a highly symmetric space and then do their work. But I don't think this is important. I fully agree, Elias. I'm on exactly the same frequency as you. Yeah. Ash Ashley? Oh. I think so. Elias basically touched on what I was going to ask. So, that, so, that was, that was so the last question is by Davide. Yeah, hi, I have a simple question. I heard about this KKLT proposal. Does it fall in the, cut, which would be the sitter compatibilization? Would it fall in the category of strongly coupled uh, theories or it would like in the, you had four options in one of your right. slides, where would it fall? Thanks. Yeah, very good question. I promised in my abstract to talk about KKLT and then I saw I had 30 minutes and I dropped it completely. So thank you for the question. Um, yes, so KKLT is of course one of the first. Uh, proposals for the sitter space, so it, it would fall in uh, the first category. But then we have been working a lot in the last couple of four or five years, and KKLT has, you know, gotten quite some hits, survived some of them. Uh, so now if you ask my opinion, I'm afraid it's going to be very biased. I'm very worried about the most recent paper written by Arthur Hebecker and Daniel Jungans, and then there was another paper by Carta and Moritz, and the bottom line with their string that shows that KKLT, if it works, it's really in the non-calculable regime because Hebecker and friends, they found very non-trivial singularities inside the extra dimensions. Carta and Moritz were able to resolve them, but that resolution of these singularities really mean, means that the solution gets really out of computational control, in my opinion. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, so uh, thank you again, uh, Thomas, for your thank you. Talk. And so it's time to move to the to the next.